Welcome, welcome to The Long Road. My name is Chris Roberts. I'm here with um, Wayne Woolrich. We'll have Bill Gurney later on, the co-superintendents. And so what we're going to talk t about today is a lot of the potential changes in laws and regulations that will affect our, our school children. We might, get a, we might talk about the money later on, but these I think are some really critical things that I don't think people understand. One of the things that was, um, luckily, that was defeated <clears throat> was vaccinations. And some schools, like for example, they will provide flu vaccinations as an opportunity. Yes, they would require um, parents' right. approval. But for example, one of the ones, if you had a, an academic, an, an outbreak, and parents needed to get their children vac vaccinated, the law would say, no, you can't do it on school property. You couldn't even do it on um, the UNH system. What, what's some of the consequences that, that could do with some of our, our children get ill? Well, one of the examples that's uh, very recent uh, was H1N1. When we looked at the potential uh, catastrophe uh, relative to H1N1, many of our schools were used as sites um, where parents could come in the evening and uh, that where we could vaccinate, certainly with parent permission and with parents there with any uh, young children. So there are circumstances where public health uh, could be certainly compromised um, if we didn't have the ability to vaccinate with the, you know, the proper protocol and uh, parental permission. I think the issue, um, you know, as you looked at the bill and some of the discussion, was a sense that government is too involved in the lives of uh, children. And it becomes a very difficult um, as a superintendent when you think, well, certainly you have parental rights, but you also have uh, the rights of the children. There was one legislator who I over or I heard about recently uh, when asked uh, from one of my colleagues uh, talking about this issue. And, uh, you know, he looked at him and said, do you honestly think that children have rights? And so I, I think that's certainly the extreme, but we try to balance, you know, what's best for our children. And certainly there are situations in public health uh, when we need to provide uh, services. And I know, um, you know, that we try not to be obtrusive. Uh, and we try to get things done in a way that's... Uh, very comfortable for parents, um, but I think that when we give that kind of blanket, um, kind of an ideology around no intervention at all, that there are some potential consequences that are negative, and um, I'm glad that was defeated. Yeah, because on the N1, oh, the swine flu, I'll, do, I'll be unpolitically correct, <clears throat> the swine flu, it was kind of deadly to a lot of children. It was more of the children this time around and to go and say, sorry, we're not going to allow the children, and it's in, indoors during the winter, if you have 160 to 200 children in a locked-up building and a few of them get the flu and you don't know if it's um, swine flu or not, that really puts you at risk. Yeah. If you can't vaccinate them, you may even be in a situation like around the country where some schools had to shut down because there was a panic. Right. Well, we certainly have a population that we're... we're tightly packed, um, so things spread quickly. And many of the, if you look at our population, less likely to be exposed to other, let's say, flu-like uh, viruses that have gone through in the past. So not to have the ability to, to intervene when it's appropriate, I think, is a real problem. And obviously the legislature agreed. Yeah, because one of the other final thing was it was going to say that school property could not be used at all so even if Cheshire Medical said, I would like to rent your property to do this outreach, you would not, you'd be prevented from doing that. Right. And how's it going, Bill? Very well. How are you, sir? Okay. We'll just jump into one of your favorite topics <laughs> in, a, in a facetious type of way because yeah. you're proactive in trying to prevent it. The change in the bully, bullying law mm -hmm. that the House passed. Could you explain to the people how the 24-7 how the concept works? Well, currently, we're able to access uh, social media uh, opportunities like Facebook and, uh, and those, those kind of milieu to, uh, to determine what's going on in the schools. 
and also use that what we learn as evidence in bullying cases that we gather from those social uh, networking uh, options, we can use that to determine the extent of a problem. Um, if the legislature is to go back to the old days when we, had only, we could only address things that happened within the school buildings or on the property, we would lose a lot of our uh, data to determine actually what's going on. Uh, you know, we work very closely with the Keene Police Department now. Our SRO is very skilled in all of these social network uh, options, and uh, he brings that information into school every day. And if our hands are going to be tied, it's going to make it much harder for us to address bullying, bullying issues as they crop out. Um, I was reading an article yesterday where um, some pictures of a child were sent out um, across a, a wide span. And, and those pictures arrived at 1 o'clock in the morning on kids' cell phones. And their cell phones were ringing. And when they came into school, uh, the kids involved felt like the whole school knew what was going on. Uh, with the exception of the administration <laughs> and teachers. Uh, so if we're going to be asked to address these issues within school, we have to know what's going on outside of school. It's a whole new world than when uh, we all were in school, where kids could get home, go home and escape from uh, the pressures of school, whether they're positive pressures or the negative ones like bullying. The, um, the Boston Globe, the Sunday Globe, they have an article for kids 14 to 16 talking about sleeping with their cell phones. There was a 14-year-old girl who talks about she gets over 100 texts a night. So it goes off. She felt it was important to Johnny break up with Susie or mm -hmm. whatever. So I get something nasty, nasty text at, at night, and then I can just send it back like you're talking about. Yeah, and it's just going wildfire, and you don't know how many texts, yep. and who knows by the time you walk up and walk into school in the morning. We had a uh, speaker at Keene High a couple weeks ago. Uh, who had lost a, a son to suicide following some bullying um, in middle school. His recommendation to parents at the meeting was to pass the basket at 9 o'clock. And uh, he recommends families pass a basket around at 9. Everyone throws their cell phones in, including the adults. <laughs> and then they have an hour of television or family time, and, and people go to bed. Uh, for a lot of families, that may not be realistic. But... It's a simple way of addressing a, a really complex problem. And at least the children are getting a good night's sleep. And if there is something that confronts them, they're getting it at 7 or 8 o'clock in the morning after a good night's sleep rather than being woken up at 1 or 2. The, um, I don't know if you, you've seen the video of YouTube. It's going vi viral. It was on CNN this morning, MSNBC, um, Fox, down in Australia. you got a heavy set kid who is getting punched in the face by him. Um, about a 12-year-old, and, <clears throat> and everybody's saying how bad it is and because it's bullying, but all the big news people are, are showing it. Then it's a 16-year-old kid, big kid. He just got fed up after getting um, punched in the face. I mean, he just picked up the kid like WWF and slammed him right mm -hmm. down on the back on um, concrete. And then the kid's days is like, looks like he had suffered a serious concussion. Yeah. So... People go out. Wow, this has been happening for three years. No one stepped in. No one notified. Now one kid can be possibly hurt, and the other kid who had been bullying just created a crime. He, yep. he would a crime. He could be his life could be ruined because felonious assault. Mm -hmm. And like that's much that's bad, but that's much better than the, the girl in Massachusetts who committed suicide over bullying. Yep. I was talking with some parents. <clears throat> uh, last Thursday and Friday, uh, about a similar situation. The administration and teachers didn't know, the parents didn't know that this boy had been singled out. And uh, we were fortunate that it didn't lead to, to a very serious complication. The, um, the, the, law, the, the House bill that passed out of the House and is going to the Senate will restrict your, your opportunity as superintendents and administrators <clears throat> to only on scoop from bell to bell. Mm -hmm. And I was thinking, well, I'll get nailed if I text something or put on YouTube while I'm in the library. But if I'm one of the, the kids that can leave for lunch, so if I leave school, I go to McDonald's and I text all the nasty stuff, and it's right there when I show back up at school under new changes. I haven't done anything wrong, and there's nothing you can do to me. 
I, that's my interpretation, not having asked our attorney to, to study it, uh, whether during the school day uh, that would extend out. I doubt it. And I think you're absolutely right that that would tie our hands. And, yeah, right. Well, one of the, the issues we have, uh, of course, this law we just passed in June. And uh, we put a workshop day together for our administrators in August. We had someone come to speak to all of the faculty uh, at before school started, and we've been we worked with our school boards, developed uh, school policies around bullying that had to be implemented by the end of December. Um, by the end of April, we have to have all of our training in. Most of our schools now have training for volunteers, for all our staff. They've had training for students. We put a lot of energy into it, um, but we still don't know what the result of the you know the effort is because we don't have track record um, that where we can speak to you know what what's happened as a result of this new law so to then reverse it uh, at least a substantive part relative to cyberbullying which is probably the biggest component of, of new bullying type cases to take the superintendent out of it as far as the ability of the principal to get a waiver of that that 48 hour window by speaking with the, the superintendent in situations where there's some concern about maybe um, <clears throat> issues that may have happened either in the home or in between. Uh, that's now gone with the, with the new mm -hmm. legislation. And the definition of bullying, they've reversed that. So, you know, it would be nice to be able to actually, imp if a law is implemented, for us to have the time to, to see how this uh, law works and to look at the track record to see if it indeed makes the improvements or realizes the goal that the law was initiated uh, to so or the issues to solve. So this is kind of, it's odd to have something passed in June and now to be repealed less than 12 months later after we put a great deal of effort into it. Cyberbullying is not going to go away. We need to deal with that. And uh, if, if there's another way to do it, great, but just to wipe it out um, as part of the, the plan I think would, would not be in the best interest of our students. The training has been a, a great opportunity for us to increase awareness around bullying. And uh, I think we didn't really understand the extent of the problem as a, as a profession uh, until we started to have folks come in and, and talk with us and give us instruction. Uh, otherwise, we, we were operating on a, on a whole set of uh, standards that really are totally outdated. I would hate to see us go back to that now. When you were talking about earlier parents' involvement or, or the school's involvement. Well, but I'm pretty sure as you've, you've gone along, you probably have noticed a lot of parents don't realize that their kids can be bullies. They think it's someone else or, or bullying may be um, punching someone or being physically violent. But there's a, a lot of ways to psychologically bully someone, bring them up laugh at them, move them, ostracize them. And, yeah. and it's like most parents as well, I brought my kid up better than that. How was I supposed to know? But that's what the current law gives you guys mm -hmm. the opportunity to talk to the parent and say, you know what, maybe Johnny or Susie are not the nicest person. Maybe we can do something together before it gets really out of hand. And, and most of what we've done is around prevention. <clears throat> Not a, we haven't put as much energy into identifying, uh, you know, root cause or, or the bullying, but rather early on create a social fabric or an environment where students are reporting uh, behaviors where they feel uncomfortable or they think they might be bullied or they feel that others. So we're getting that kind of deep level dialogue um, around the conversation. And I think that's been very helpful. I think our, our school counselors would tell you that, um, that we've really kind of focused once again on creating a, a kind um, school environment. I mean, you still you know, get comments, well, boys will be boys, those kinds of things. And we're trying to kind of back that thinking up a bit um, and in regards to how people interact with one another. And, and we're trying to solve this at the very earliest, yeah. kindergarten, first grade, second grade, move this kind of conversation through around a social fabric that's just more caring. There's no, I just don't think that most people in our community would take offense to a culture of, that creates a, more caring within a, the school environment. And the bullying law, even though it was very heavy handed in regards to you'll implement it by this state, et cetera, um, has helped uh, influence that conversation. I kind of look the bullying kind of like the sexual harassment. When, it, when we were growing up and you said boys are boys, that's the way of the environment. 
and you had pictures and you had all other kind of stuff that you wouldn't want in your daughter's room or someone. But, but the thing that we were taught as we were growing up, it's not our determination if we're sexually harassing somebody. It's how that individual mm-hmm. feels. And it's our responsibility to respect their opinion. And so if I have some pinup on my wall and I said, it's not bothering me and it's not bothering the five other women in the, cl- in the office, why should it bother you? Well, it, we're kind of doing that same thing with bullying. If I feel that I'm being bullying, being bullied, and I go to you and say, you know what, I think you're bullying me and I don't like it, it says, well, you're supposed to respect me and treat me better. That's one of the definitions <coughs> in the current law. It's, if you feel you're being bullied, I, and we have to uh, begin an investigation and report it out to parents or and or get that waiver within 48 hours. So that's, I'm not sure that same level of personal yeah. kind of observation is in the, the new law. Let's go something that's even worse than bullying. And I'm pretty sure there's a lot of kids who've been bullied don't probably think there's nothing worse. But we've had a couple of potential changes in New Hampshire gun law. And one of the things that would happen is anybody in New Hampshire would be able to carry a concealed weapon without having to go to, um, to the police. And, and under the, in the past, if I had some mental illness or I had some domestic violence, I wasn't allowed to carry a concealed weapon. But the new proposed law is if I'm guilty of domestic violence, if I don't ask, they can't tell me no. And so then the other part was they wanted to do away with the federal requirement, for example, around schools and and other buildings. So if I'm a parent, I decide I want to have a concealed weapon, and I show up in school and... In New Hampshire, you don't have to follow the, um, the federal law of safe schools. What do you do then? Or the 16-year-old student. You get the 16-year-old student. That wants stu- to walk into the school with, uh, with, and we suspect he may have a concealed weapon. Uh, it's going to put us in an untenable position. We're asked to be responsible for the safety of all the children and staff under our administration. Uh, this is going to tie our hands completely. And... Without this, and without being able to be sure that kids are entering our buildings without a concealed weapon, or have it in their cars, uh, you know, we're dealing with people who can be volatile. Children, uh, whether they're they're 15 or 18, they don't always think before they act. Uh, having a concealed weapon in a car, either on our pro- just off of our property, or on school property, depending on where the legislature goes, that's taken the time that a kid can reflect on whether they're insulted or they're upset with the teacher. Uh, it doesn't take long to walk to your car and walk back. Um, our ability to, to be, ensure the safety of the children will be very compromised by any changes in the gun carrying laws. You, you had a couple of years ago, <clears throat> there was a pistol in, in one of the cars. I think you had a student notify the, the police officer or the principal and the rules to search a car on school property is quite different than trying to search the car on my property. Can you explain to the public how that goes? Well, we do have, um, and the authority, uh, if we have cause to search a locker, a car, I mean, we, we can do that on, on school property. The issue is, uh, do we want to create the potential level of confusion around those kinds of issues uh, where a student may, you know, go hunting in the morning or whatever, and then drive into the parking lot and park in front of, next to the principal, you know, with, with the, the firearms, right, a bit uh, there. So we're we're hopeful that when when the dust settles, there will be an understanding that even though you know people right now, especially, want the government sort of out of their lives, and this is kind of a poster child for that uh, real strong feeling that if they, if they back up kind of the, out of the ideology into what's, what's practical and operational, there'll need to be um, a distinct level of disconnect between what might happen um, you know, on Main Street and what might happen in the, in the hallway uh, in a high school like Keene High School. So 
hopefully that will emerge if this bill moves. I guess it is moving forward. It's yet yeah, passed. Um, and uh, that, that will be in the operation part that will have a clear delineation um, in regards to those issues because certainly that what's best for students and I think Bill's absolutely yep. right. We, you know, we have adolescents who are kind of finding issues that they're sorting things out. Uh, they may not be making decisions in the same way that a 22 year old might relative to ish, you know, conflict. Um, we need that separation to make things work. And if you tie it into bullying, if you go look at a number of the, the accidents or the shootings on school, I think one in the Chicago area, 14-year-old kid get shot and killed. A lot of it, it all, because you have a lot of result of bullying and, and some of the students have some, some untreated mental illness. But the thing that always seems to be the tipping point is availability and access. Like you're talking about, <clears throat> if I park my car off school property right down that side road, mm -hmm. <clears throat> you, you really offend me, you get me upstairs, I'm steaming, and I go out to my car and I can be back in school four to five minutes. And I may have access and I now have availability. <clears throat> how do we protect the children under that? I just don't see how we... Maybe not looking some, I don't think they were looking at the long-term consequences because some of us can handle individual freedoms, but there are other people don't handle them very well and other people suffer the consequences. And when you, when you look at it at the point of view of uh, we have uh, laws against children having, children having access to alcohol until 21 years of age because we, we feel they may not have the judgment and maturity to, to deal with having uh, a few beers. And, and yet there are people who would like to give them a handgun. Uh, it, it makes absolutely no sense. I don't know, but that's politics. <laughs> <laughs> Another one, the, um, it was H. Bill 340. It was an end around um, the voucher system. And the goal was to give, <clears throat> depending what community you lived in, a parent that did not have a child in in the school system or wanted to take out the child up to $3,500 per child. And um, so, for example, in Keene, if you had four and you haven't been going to school, possibility you could write a check for $14,000. Here it goes. The state wouldn't help you out. And we got it defeated. I, I talked to the foreman. And <clears throat> if we took four kids out of every grade level in Keene or 52 children, we wouldn't reduce staff, we wouldn't reduce building, mm -hmm. because it would, but it would cost us over $150,000. And I go, well, well, that's going to reduce costs. I says, no, if you take kids out and you take the money out, it's going to cause the cost per student to go up. And I just don't see how you can just keep pulling kids out because we were talking before, if I take my kid out for four or five years because I like the money, then all of a sudden it's like, well, you know what, send him back. He's a fifth grader, but he only functioned at a second grade level. Who, who pays for it? Right. That would be the community. Right. Well, then I'm sort of the second <laughs> loss of funds. And issues I you know, have around that include that <clears throat> that parents, even though they certainly have a right uh, to pull student out of school and homeschool, but this kind of legislation would inc encourage those parents who may not have that real better best interest of their student in mind, and we're sur sort of circumventing um, the compulsory education and the fundamental right that students have to to get a quality education. That fundamental right is what built our democracy as far as the, the thinking that we need an educated population in order to make the kinds of decisions that we need to make to move forward and in, in, in not just compete globally, but create an environment that is harmonious and productive. So to give that up, to I'll just write a check to parents, even though it would create a bigger disconnect with public ed and therefore down the road might reduce the competition for funds. 
the immediate concern are those students who are sort of lost, um, who may not get a quality education. We know that three quarters, almost 80 percent of our uh, prisoners uh, never uh, completed high school. We know that our employers are saying we need um, better educated um, people than ever, skilled with content, ability to communicate. I mean, those kinds of things. And we're, we're, if we even create a two or three or four year gap in, in that you know, ability to build that citizen, um, I think that's a huge mistake. So I hope that uh, that kind of conversation, I know there are other bills like that, <laughs> That are um, enabling parents if they if they have a conscientious yep. objection to a school or a program, they can pull uh, the student out. Um, you know, without the kind of homeschooling safety net that we've had in the past. I'm, I'm concerned about the the public's um, kind of being nonchalant mm -hmm. rel relative to writing. <laughs> The, the, that importance of, of making certain that every student gets a quality education. I, I just don't think we really want to give that up. To go into <clears throat> the follow up, which a couple of bills. One that would say that it's the, the parent's absolute right to determine the, the quality and level of education of their child. So if the parent wants to take their kid out of school at 16, it's the parent's choice. The superintendents can't get involved. The child can't get involved. It's mom and dad's choice, plain and simple. You know, and I know two years ago uh, with the, the 18 <coughs> law, uh, that created a lot of, a lot of work uh, relative to creating program to make that work for students. And, and the state <coughs> has paid, I think, uh, 1.6 million, I think, they've, I don't know, 16 million maybe over the course. But that's all yeah. will be gone with the uh, new house uh, uh, budget. What, it, what it has happened, uh, two years ago, dropout rate dropped by about 63%, last year 44%. Statewide now, we're below 1%. And Keene High is, is remarkable relative to the programs they've created, getting kids back in school, using technology and, and being more creative and flexible so that we match student schedules. We, uh, New Hampshire right now is being looked at as kind of a leader uh, in our ability to keep kids and students in school. Because nationwide, about 30% of the kids never finish. Right. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, how, how great is this? And then two years later, to overturn this and go back to 16. Um, I know there was one student that testified who, who was come from Massachusetts, that if, she'd been, if she had remained there, she would have dropped out. She had, like, straight Fs as a freshman, wasn't getting any credits. She graduated in New Hampshire as a senior with straight A's. And uh, she, of course, a great uh, testimony relative to the importance of compulsory education through 18. That was a great example. I'm sure there are other examples like that. But when I look at the fact that we've cut dropout rates in, in Keene from about 4.5% to well below 1%, um, it's remarkable. And I think of all of the faces that have really had been advantaged um, through, this, uh, through this law, which really didn't cost as much as we originally thought. Um, so I think it would be a step backwards. And so a 16 or 17-year-old, 18-year-old who has, has problem in the classroom, there are other ways that you can get the, him or her credits, whether, for example, if I'm a, um, a guitar player and if I'm working out in town as in a band or whatever, I could probably end up using that, the same thing as being in, in band class. So we can work it out both ways. It just doesn't mean a 16 or a 17 has to spend all of his or her day in the classroom. Right. And we also offer options around when they, when they have to take the classes. <laughs> uh, through our community education program, a student can have a full-time job and still continue on with classes. Or they can take some classes at the high school, some in the community <laughs> ed and be duly enrolled. Um, that continues to allow us to provide services for the child. Uh, the state still supports their education through the adequacy aid. And they have the option of graduating with 20 credits through community ed as opposed to 25 at Keene High School. So if they have fallen behind on their class, on their credits, this is a way to catch up and, and move on to whatever their, the next step in their careers are uh, by utilizing both the school and community ed. We don't want to see any of that go away. Governor Lynch was down uh, last fall talking with kids in, 
in our uh, dual enrollment program, asking why they stayed in school. And the law is really the stick. Uh, and and it's a, we can go to kids and their parents and say, it's the law, your child has to stay in school. Uh, what we've done uh, to keep them there and entice them into coming back is the uh, dual enrollment and other programs so that they're graduating with what they need uh, to be more successful in their life. So if you take away the law, we can still offer the programs, but we're giving up the stick that we can walk into a home and say, your child has to be there, it's the law. And that's what gets <coughs> us in the door, to have the conversation. You had talked about homeschooling. My daughter, she certifies as a teacher, and she homeschools three of the grandsons. And, but each year, they have to take a test to ensure they're making progress right. under, under Georgia. One of the things they're looking at in New Hampshire is taking the school system out of the homeschool oversight. Right. That's always been a concern. I mean, we, we don't have, obviously, what they have in, in Georgia. Yeah. Right? Currently, parents don't have to take an exam, just have to report out that the student's doing well or whatever and ready to go. Um, but to, to remove us altogether um, from any oversight um, you know, is a further kind of step away from the protection that some students deserve vast majority of students who are homeschooled are getting a quality uh, environment relative to their their school. But the, you can imagine that there are also some issues that might incent um, a parent to pull a student out of school um, that may be not always in the best interest of the child. Maybe the student isn't getting to, to school or and, and the school is saying, you know, we, we, we've got a real pattern here of absences that are getting in the way and, and that kind of friction which can create an interest of, of rarely happens, but when it does, it's very good uh, if we have some kind of oversight. And if nothing else, that we can help provide curriculum, resources, connect with grade level, allow the possibility of an early uh, kind of moving back a transition that makes it easy for the student, maybe to take part in some field trips, some extracurricular activities to be part, which homeschool students can. You know, they can participate in football or hockey or band or whatever. Um, but allowing that kind of transition. So maybe it's a good idea, maybe a student is doing well to be homeschooled in the second, third grade, maybe in the fourth grade, or maybe in the seventh grade. Parents say, we, well, we don't have the same ability to maybe do the kinds of enriching things that we were doing earlier. Maybe it's time for the student to get back into public school. We want that transition to be as smooth as possible. And to take us out altogether, I think, will we'll make it more abrupt and make it more difficult um, to transition back into public ed. And to me, if, um, if I'm 13, 14 years old, and I want to go into forensic medicine, and I mean, I'm at home school, and I ask my mom or my dad, what, do I, what courses I have to take? Or where should I look at going? We're probably going to get some glazed over looks. Mm -hmm. That's where the importance of a school guidance counselor, and that can help in the whole school, home school right. group. And to maybe offer those courses, <clears throat> we do offer a forensic course at Keene High. <laughs> Most parents, at least certainly I couldn't have my chip for my children, mm -hmm. have offered that kind of expertise. Uh, so that, that they would, kids would miss out on that and when it came to competition to getting into good schools uh, might, not, uh, might not fare as well as they might if they had been in school at least part of the time. Because, again, my, my grandkids, there's three or four women, they switch the courses, mm -hmm. they teach what they're the best at. The, um, <clears throat> the grandson, the oldest one, goes for music and PE at the public school. So... It's just not one individual. So, and I think a lot of the homeschool ones, the quality ones, it's a collaborative. We always use that word, but I think it's a collaborative between public and homeschooling. Right. And, and I think those are the best homeschool cases where that collaboration mm -hmm. is evident. We welcome it. Tim Tebow never went to public school. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so <clears throat> we're just looking at just some of these things that are just popping up. And it comes over and over again. Parents' rights, get strength down government. But where did the kids come in? Well, my contention is that our future um, is solely in the hands of 
the children and our responsibility to make sure that they're prepared for their future is no less than the responsibility that those who helped us get through school. The difference is, when I was in public education, um, 60 or 70 percent of the people in the community had a connection with the school. They likely had a relative in the school. Um, and now it's around 20 percent. So it, it, we have to reach out um, and communicate what's of value in our schools, what's happening in our schools, because the responsibility that this population and that we have to educate students is even greater. I, we don't have the kinds of jobs that we may have had four, three or four decades ago where people could kind of just go into maybe factory work, some of the other things that, that don't take the kinds of the skill set that we need today. If we're going to compete internationally, um, I think it's imperative that we continue to reach out, and even in tough economic times, um, reach out and make certain that the fabric of public education, of education in general, uh, is strong. And uh, we, we can't catch back. If we lose a couple of years, you know, if, if there's something dramatic that happens in, in the legislative session where we're, you know, looking years from now to kind of catch up, uh, it's difficult to catch up with students. Once they have a big gap, it's really hard, you know, to catch up in the future. So hopefully any <coughs> thinking relative to laws that influence the classroom, the, the student, uh, our, our uh, schools in general will be thought about more in a long-term uh, manner. What will this do down the, you know, five years from now? Where will the student be at 18 or 22 as a result of, of what we're doing um, in the legislature? So hopefully they're having that conversation. Certainly students don't vote uh, unless they're 18. <laughs> And we don't have a large population if you look at the whole number of students uh, that we have, but they have just they have a right to that quality education, and we're hopeful that the legislature will keep that in mind as they move forward. There was one individual who put that bill in that wanted to restrict education funding funding to just the basics, and he feels that. <clears throat> Anyone else, any community who wants to do anything more than the basics can spend, use their own money. But there's a, another article in the New Hampshire magazine talking about disability. And we were talking about what years ago, 25, 30 years ago, you could be 18 or even younger, drop out of school or get your diploma, go work in a factory or go work at manual labor make good money. Now they're 45, 50 years old, their body is used up, they haven't had an education, and now they're going, what am I going to do with the rest of my life? Because they can't catch up. Yeah. And the jobs that they would have normally re-educated to are not there. I think the movement towards <laughs> compulsory education uh, was, was one that our current legislature should go back and review. Uh, you and I have been in, in other countries. We've seen what happens when there is a, a group um, in a community for which there's not, school is not available and there's no interest in going. You create a permanent underclass. Um, I've seen it in Central America and in North Africa uh, where you, I'm walking on my way to school and I know the children that I'm working with uh, have virtually unlimited opportunities because they're going to have a good high school education and they're going to have access to college. But I'm walking by children as I go to those schools that have never stepped foot in a school, have no idea what it's like to be in a school, and have no idea of the opportunities that will come for kids who are able to go to school. That permanent underclass uh, really can't be in a country that wants to be a democracy. We all need certain skills and we all need the opportunity to make a living that can support our families. If we start to not have kids go through our school system, where the, this creation of a permanent underclass is going to undermine our whole society. Uh, that's, that's on a you know, more uh, open level, but you know, it affects the child. It also affects us as parts, as parts of this culture. The, um, <clears throat> I don't know if you read Sunday's King Sentinel when they were talking about the difference in, in in education and, and the classes where I think the number is about 33 or 35,000, <clears> 90% <throat> of all American workers 
fall under the 35,000 or, or less. But the part that really struck me in the middle of the article, it said that 16% of the kids who are in the middle class now will fall out of the middle class down into the, the lower class, working class or even working poor. And it seems as, as around the country, as we're looking at cutting back on education, it used to be when we were growing up, we were always going to move. If we were willing to work, we had the opportunity, we were always going to move up. I just can't picture going to, looking at the high school and saying, you got a graduating class of four, 400 people and say, hey, 60%, 60 of you kids are going to be worse off than your parents. I don't think that should be the goal of public education. Nope. Yeah. And, and that's sort of the irony right now is at a time when, we, when public education is more important to our national economy and our future, uh, there is a sense um, in many states of pulling back relative to the kind of support uh, fabric that we have that we've have with public education at a chance when we, time we really need to, to move forward. For example, the Common Core is one of yep. the, the bills to remove the Common Core. It's likely uh, will pass. Forty-three states have adopted the Common Core. It allows students to move from state to state with a good, you know, firm uh, expectation of what's next. It will enable us to get some program and textbooks and things that were probably better suited for the curriculum, will allow a, kind of a growth model to move forward as we look at how to gauge our students' success. We'll keep our students in the military who move at least six times on average um, from state to state, not disadvantaged. Our colleges are saying, you know, as you send us seniors, graduate, we're spending more money in remediation. Yep. All, there are so many reasons why we need to move forward with this, and I know at this point we're pulling back primarily because we feel that it's just the federal government being heavy-handed. But this is, and I know I've said personally, <laughs> relative to No Child Left Behind, there were times when they implemented, you know, with no funding, issues with that legislation that I didn't believe in. But the, the Common Core is one place where I think we are all on the, on the same. The governor's uh, council put this together with the commissioners. Uh, this is an area where we can be moving forward, and I hope that we will continue to do that. Because our students, in order to compete, in order to get that 16%, <laughs> back into the middle class and start to move our competitive nature. We need to compete with China, India, Norway, UK. When you look at the number of days that some of these students around the world go, when you look at how focused their curriculum is on a national level, uh, when you look at how important it is that, that in the home uh, relative to their being prepared for school each day, we need to create that same expectation here. As I, I know, I've mentioned to you that 50% of the uh, PhDs in engineering last year were, you, were foreign nationals, that we're seeing students who are tr really ready in, in core areas to come into our colleges from other countries and do very, very well. We need to, boil, we need to build up that same fa fabric in this country. Um, otherwise, I think uh, we will be moving to more of that underclass and, and it will become uh, more and more troublesome, which is that spiral that we're just on the edge of, of the kind of the vortex of the, the whirlpool um, that we need to say here. Well, it wasn't by undercutting the public. There are other things involved. But if we start to pull out of our support for public education because we're frustrated with what's happening on the national level or the personal level, I mean, everybody's more centric in tough times. But if we start to pull back, I think we will find it very, very difficult to swim out of that uh, hole uh, with the, as the whirlpool begins to go. So there's that point, you know, where you're kind of at the edge. It's, it's a critical moment. Um, and this, to me, is kind of where we are in public education. This is a time to say, okay, what are we doing right? Let's do it better. Let's compete more vigorously, not let's pull back and see if we can throw some experimental programs out and see what sticks. It's not a time to do that. We have to be more intelligent and more forthright, thoughtful than that. And, and it's a two-tiered attack. It's not just on students, particularly those that may, be, uh, may have the least advantages in our society. It's also against the folks who are delivering that education, uh, and that's the teachers in the classroom. The attack on uh, collective bargaining, uh, the attack on, uh, on retirement benefits are going to have long-lasting effects when uh, our highly qualified students are graduating from college, they have the option of several careers to pursue. If they feel that um, a long-term commitment to education is not economically feasible, we're going to lose those kids coming into our profession. 
uh, and we're not going to be able to fill those, those gaps. We're looking currently at a, a loss of up to a million teachers over the next 10 years as people my age age out of the profession. Uh, we need people to replace them and attacking uh, unions and collective bargaining and, uh, and saying that there won't be pensions there for you at the end are going to persuade uh, some of our brightest and most talented kids to seek other professions. I was talking to, to Wayne <clears throat> while we're waiting for you. Yep. And um, I was on, on Facebook on one of these. I always like to throw those things out to get people questioning. And I says, the question I says, what happens if we do away with the, um, the teachers' unions? Do we become to baseball-style free agency? The physics teacher in demand, so he gets a million. An English teacher, dime a dozen, so they get 25000 And now you go, the school districts compete for the best free agent. Mm -hmm. You go and say, well, you know what, I can think I can get Roberts over here. So I'm just not going to give these two people contracts. Then all at the last minute, Roberts signs with someone else. And it's like, holy crap, I have these two um, vacancies. I got to get some warm bodies. Or... Do you give one, two, three-year contracts? Or do you give me a five-year contract and then you find out that I'm a dud? How do you get rid of me for those mm -hmm. five years? Or even kind of worse, when we were talking about, talking about workforce housing. We in New Hampshire are saying we don't want workforce housing. But most of the teachers qualify for workforce housing. They're not, workforce housing is not low-income housing. It's teachers and firemen and, and policemen. So... Do we go back to it used to be in the 1800s and early 1900s where you compete for the best teachers and you give them salary and benefits and the best communities can get some of the best teachers and other communities can end up with nothing? And in our situation, we're so close to Vermont, Massachusetts. Um, the issue of not growing people through the college system um, because they feel that their future is less certain there's also the issue of that out-migration of those okay. people who are, who are standouts, who can yeah. easily get a job. Um, I mean, it's not a, a long commute uh, in either direction. We need to be competitive in the area, and we need to grow teachers into a profession where they feel like they're valued. So those are two um, real issues that are out there uh, if there's something dramatic that happens um, you know, at the legislature this session. And, and we as a school district have benefited from some of the upheaval in communities around us. We've uh, been able to recruit and hire some very qualified, experienced teachers to work in the Keene School District um, because, the, because other communities haven't been able to offer contracts uh, or to offer long-term uh, collective bargaining agreements. I would hate to see us lose that advantage uh, because that will trickle down to, to Keene kids. Because you're talking about Vermont, Massachusetts. People say, well, well, Massachusetts has like a 5 or 5.5% five income tax. But you know what? Pioneer, Pine, was it Pioneer Valley? Mm -hmm. it, it's a good school. And I look at New Hampshire um, property tax. I look at the way New Hampshire is talking about it. We don't know if they're going to fund education. You're talking about, you know, I don't know about my retirement. I don't know about all these. You know what? Pioneer may be looking a heck of a lot better, and it's not that far down the road. We're also dependent on families moving to the area. When I moved up here in the 80s, uh, demand was high for housing. Uh, schools were considered outstanding. And the population of Cheshire County and Hillsborough, where I was at the time, was expanding rapidly. Cheshire lost 1% of their population last year. And I think you've mentioned several times the average age of someone moving, moving into New Hampshire is mid-50s to early 60s. Uh, who don't have children in the school system and don't have a stake in ensuring that the school systems will continue to function at a high level. Because I think um, <clears throat> it's getting pretty close to, to 60 communities, basically use it, gated communities, basically 55 and older, with the great majority of the people coming from out of state, coming to New Hampshire, no sales tax, no income tax, no death tax, all you have to do is pay your dividend tax. And you're right. They don't want to pay any taxes to, to local communities. I was going through Moton Bro, $8, round off, $8 per thousand. They have almost three times as much pr value property 
than Keene does. Mm -hmm. And that's a really a bedroom community. And they're leading the fight of, we don't want to spend any money whatsoever. We do not want to be a donor town. We don't care about the other kids in New Hampshire. We worry about our own. And then you have other communities that are paying 30, 31, even 30, 31 plus in Berlin. What type of education can you give your children in Berlin at $31. And, and the whole movement around the CR, CACR 12, which <coughs> looks like have a majority and will likely get through 60% House yeah, and Senate. Get through the House, yes. Um, and be a referendum in 2012, would allow Moultonboro and other communities yep. with a huge tax base and, and maybe few students mm -hmm. to step away from a statewide commitment around um, funding education. Uh, Berlin, uh, to some degree, keen uh, communities that have you know more students and relatively less in regards to taxable evaluation for property would be really stressed to provide the current level oh. of education, um, much less to you know improve as we move forward. So there are some real issues around that, um, and I know that that debate will be coming because it will be during the presidential election mm -hmm. of 2012, and we'll actually have that referendum. We'll have to get. Uh, two-thirds of the population, but clearly has 60%, I believe, in it, the it, Senate. It, and I know it has 60 It's oh, already oh, passed oh, in the House. In the House. So <clears throat> that is that movement away from the statewide responsibility that we've been speaking against for a long mm -hmm. time. And it's definitely coming forward. Um, and we hope that we'll have an opportunity on shows like this and in the newspaper or wherever yeah. To, to get the history of uh, state funding in when the courts were not involved. And I've mentioned before yep. that uh, we have funded public education at about 8% um, in prior to Claremont. Uh, the next one was, we were 50th, 49th was South Dakota at 28% funding. We went up to like 42% uh, after Claremont, which was great help to keen uh, taxes. Our taxes dropped dramatically, like $11 million over the course of a couple of years. Um, but since then, it's gone down to about 19%. And there are those that say, well, uh, we can't afford 19%. Uh, let's get us out altogether and let communities spend on their own. That's not in the best interest of kids in this state. To me, it's hard to conceive <clears throat> that New Hampshire will probably be the only, if the Constitution Amendment would pass, and again, we need to work so it doesn't pass, but if it was to pass, it would be in the New Hampshire Constitution that says, I would not be responsible, it would be against the law for me to spend, for to spend one penny of my money to help educate any other kid in the state of New Hampshire. I think people talk about Jefferson, Jeffersonian principle. Jefferson said over and over again, a republic requires a well-educated community. He understood the importance, but I'm looking. <clears throat> I don't see, I think we'd be the laughing stock. I think it would be a big Supreme Court case saying the state of New Hampshire says we're not educating anybody except our own and our own community. That would be like putting blinders on and saying you, people, you other kids don't count. Right. And I think it would be a major factor for <coughs> corporations uh, or entrepreneurs looking to start <coughs> businesses and have a workforce to think about locating to New Hampshire when they have absolutely no idea what their local, pro how out of control their local property tax might be to support the schools. Um, it's, it's a wild card that most companies would not want to play on the table. So we went fast. <coughs> uh, I want to thank you. And I'm pretty sure that you'll be talking to other people and other people need to start talking and asking questions because some of these bills are coming so fast and furious that people are not paying attention to them. And, you know, and all they do is say HB 340, HB 370, and people don't have the foggiest idea. So they can go to the New Hampshire um, website, United, New Hampshire General Court, and they can look up these buildings. For example, they can type in education, and mm -hmm. all these bull, um, bills will pop up. Bullying, they will pop up. Yep. And, so. and, and Wayne's blog also has a good deal of information. <laughs> on our perspective of the, well, actually Wayne's, <laughs> no. because he's, the, he's uh, been taking this on as a responsibility for the district. So his website uh, has some excellent advice as well. Again, so I want to thank both of you, thank Wayne you. and Bill. And Pleasure so, to be here. Yep. We'll probably be back again in the future. Well, thank you, and hope this was entertaining, and we'll see you on the long road.